So thank God thank for those special times when he tells us. And he just kind of enfolds us in his love. Amen. Yeah. All right, I'd like to talk to you this morning and deal with the subject. Uh, when we were doing Romans 13 a few weeks ago, it asked us to do that. Some of you, you know, we had a good, good response to the ministry of, of Romans 13 and godly government, what that means to us and so forth. And my mind had kind of going back and forth on that. We've been looking at uh, going into the subject of dealing with the family. But as the week progressed, I just felt uh, moved in my spirit as I was looking at dealing with aspects of father, you know, mothers, children, all that. Just have them put it together on the direction I want to go. So I felt the Lord would have me go this direction as we kind of do some review. We did, did, we did a lot of review when we were dealing with Romans 13 and, you know, the four major forms of government. Was that last week, the four major forms of government? Yes. yes. Okay, that was last week. And so you guys appreciate it. Kevin wanted a copy, so we made copies for you guys. And, you know, Elijah was taking pictures on the board of it and stuff. And so we're just kind of kind of going that way of some review. So doing some kind of review of things that I have taught you through the years and kind of solidifying them and putting them together. And so today I would like to deal with the, the subject of biblical methods in dealing with tyrants. Yeah. Biblical methods in dealing with tyrants and solidify and perhaps some of you express, you know, some new thoughts concerning the subject. But we live in a time of tyranny all around us. And so how do we biblically deal with that tyranny? They're tyrannizing us uh, even as we speak this week. Uh, DJ and Stacy told me some new law came into California that if a relative, had, if you have lived with like your, uh, maybe it was your girlfriend or your ex-wife or your sister had lived with you at some point, anybody that cohabited with you at some point, uh, can now all they have to do is get a restraining order and they'll come in and seize all your firearms, correct? Right. Very scary stuff. Extremely scary. The good news, it doesn't happen until... Next two, year. It's, yeah, next year. So we got a little ways before you get that. So that kind of stuff is absolute tyranny. They're looking for ways in California to strip the people of the right to defend themselves. And so they're passing this kooky thing. I mean, I, you, you, some of you guys have relatives. You know you have relatives and somebody that you that you let spend your time in your house. And boy, if they could, you know, mess you over, they would. Very frightening, very frightening stuff. And so we live in a time of tyranny. So, but there are biblical methods because the Bible speaks to every area of life. This book is God's word. And there is anything that this book doesn't cover, so it, de it covers the area of dealing with tyrants. So let's define a tyrant first in Webster's 1828 Dictionary. What is a tyrant? Because we're going to find the biblical methods in dealing with a tyrant. A tyrant is a monarch or other ruler, not just a king now, other ruler or master who uses power to oppress his subjects. A pastor can be a tyrant. Yeah. I'll tell you what. A father can be a tyrant. Okay. A mother can be a tyrant. A person who exercises unlawful authority, authority that they don't have to oppress and subjugate people, or lawful authority in an unlawful manner. Because the civil magistrate, how, did, how does that play? How can you have lawful authority in an unlawful manner? Because the civil magistrate has the power of the sword, according to Romans 13. They can incarcerate people in an unlawful manner for no reason, just at a whim, right? And hold them, those kinds of things. One who by taxation, injustice, or cruel punishment, think of Kent Hovind, in jail for 10 years, and Eric Holder says he's going to make an example out of him and let him rot there. He was he was time to get out, right? He was ready to get out. Way beyond the call of duty. In, in other words, they oppressed this righteous man who went around the country, ran around the world, teaching on creation. And now, uh, according to what I heard last, that Eric Holder was going to hold him and make him an example out of him. Don't resist the government because New he's charge. a Christian man around the country saying, we have a lawful right to do so. So, cruel punishment or the demand of unreasonable services imposes burdens and hardships. Vince was just telling me a week ago, I can't remember who we were to talk about, but he said that somebody that he knew, uh, the guy from Idaho, I believe it was, Vince, was, they, were, they were giving him diesel therapy. Diesel therapy is what they do a lot of times with tax pro, trusters, and Christians. And that is, you sit in a Greyhound bus, in a prison bus, you sit there for four, five, six, eight hours a day with the bus just idling. And then they take you to another location, and then you sit in the bus for six or eight hours a day. So you're having to breathe in in the bus diesel fumes. That's diesel therapy. It's another form of torture that our uh, government uses against especially patriots. 
And uh, so that's going on as we speak. So this is tyranny. This is tyrants doing this to Christians. The demand of unreasonable services imposes burdens and hardships on those under his control, which law and humanity do not authorize, yeah. or which the purposes of government do not require. That's tyranny going way far, far beyond. Jim Jones, right? Remember that? Anybody remember the name? Jim yeah. Jones up in Frisco. All right, there's a perfect example of a tyrant. Authorizing it, calling upon it, you know, and demanding his people do all kinds of things, and of course drink Kool-Aid at the point of a gun, poison Kool-Aid. That's that's absolute tyranny and tyrants. So when we think of tyrants, it's not always someone in the civil magistrate. It could be someone behind the pulpit. It could be anybody. It could be uh, an uncle or anybody that is laying oppression on you and uh, doing so in a despotic way, a despotic ruler, a cruel master, an oppressor. God, that we would be free from those who would oppress us. That's why Paul tells in Timothy, he says, pray for those that are in authority that we would lead a godly and peaceful life, not an oppressed life. Now, a Christian may resist a tyrant, but they do not rebel against one. This is a concept that if you can get, it'll, it'll be, you'll be way ahead in the curve of Christianity, if you can understand this concept, I'm going to give you real quick as we start. A Christian may resist a tyrant, but he doesn't rebel against one. Because he knows that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, the Bible says. Amen. So I, I quote off in the prayer, I'm just paraphrasing, of George Washington, because he called him a rebel. Matter of fact, what did they do at Lexington Green? The, I forget, the, the, the leader there of the, of the uh, Tories said, Disperse ye rebels. Disperse ye rebels. Shot went off. Story, all right. But by, by the way, the shot, that particular shot, couldn't have been the colonists because the ghost colonists were at that time under Jonas Clark were following Knoxian doctrine, which was um, uh, George Knox from Scotland, and they felt that blood must, their blood must first be shed before they could shed, shed the blood of a tyrant. All right. Now I don't hold that view, but that's the view that they held at that time. So when they say, we don't know who fired that first shot at Lexington Green, we do know because the theology of the Christians at that time under Pastor Jonas Clark, who was out there in front, was we can't fire until our blood is first been spilled. Like I said, they don't hold that doctrine. That's how. That's one of the reasons I don't know historically all right, who people fired that first shot. But he said, disperse your rebels. And George Washington, in his prayer, he says, Lord, you discern whether I'm acting as a rebel or whether I'm acting in obedience to you and to your law of word. There's a big difference there. Where does rebellion come in then? Rebellion comes in when one disobeys or resist lawful authority. So, for example, let's just say MS-13, for the sake of example, MS-13 moves into Tulare County. Most of you are from Tulare County. Let's just say you're all from Tulare County. And MS-13 says, we are now taking over. They have paid off the civil magistrates. They've paid off the county sheriff. And they are now the governing force, as they are in the um, you know, cities down along the Rio Grande and other places. MS-13 is a definitely a force to be reckoned with. And they say, to the, they say to businessmen, unless you pay this extortion fee, they wouldn't use that term, but unless you pay a protection fee, Bonita. we're going to take your business and destroy it. So now, if you say, you know what, I know MS-13, I know they like to cut off heads. I know they're very evil, they're very cruel. Somebody has to stand up for them. We can't all cower to them or we're all going to be enslaved. And you say, I won't pay the fee. But they say, we are the new people in charge. We're the new people on the block. We have authority. We have the power of the sword. And if you don't play our way, we're going to kill you or we're going to destroy your business. Now, is that person who says, I'm not going to pay your extortion fee, are they in rebellion or are they resisting? Resisting. They're resisting, right? That's right. That's right. But a lawful authority now, you can be in rebellion to a lawful authority. If, uh, if uh, you know, for, for example, if I said as your pastor here today, I said, uh, uh, let's all take time to pray. We need to seek the Lord in this matter. And somebody said, we've been praying enough, Pastor. I don't feel like doing it. <laughs> would he be resisting authority? Or would he be in rebellion? Rebellion. See, he would be in rebellion. See, I, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's the, you, you resist, you resist tyranny. You resist tyrants. But rebellion comes in under lawful authority. That's where rebellion is. 
uh, 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 I'll give you the same thing. For instance, that you tell the teenage son, the father has, the father tells the teenage son, you lied to mom this week, so we can't have wine in the house. Therefore, you are not going to have the car keys this week. You're, you're grounded, you're not going to have the car keys. And say so the teenage son heard Pastor Campbell's message here on tyranny, and he says, wow, my dad's a tyrant. He won't let me have the keys. I can't go out this weekend. In the sense is I'm going to steal those. I'm going to take those keys and I'm going to go out anyway. Is he resisting authority? Is he in rebellion? Rebellion. Uh, <clears throat> now let's say, for instance, now what if a father says, uh, son, and this is a true story, man, here in Thurves, this goes way, way back before any of you were here, barely the Campbells were probably here at this time, maybe before the Campbells time. But I know the story, I know the family. Well, there was a father that would take his son to visit a uh, house of prostitution. Here in Thurves, mm -hmm. they would go down into the valley to visit prostitutes. The teenage son, could he at that time say, Father, uh, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to obey you. I'm not going to go to that house of prostitution with you. Yeah. Would he be a, in rebellion or would he be resisting tyranny? Resisting. You see the, you see the difference. You see, we do have it. We understand it. But all of a sudden, the church world, when it comes to the civil magistrate, we don't understand it. We can't do it. We can't. Yes, we can. We just have to understand. We have to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Okay, David. I was just going to mention about the last 15 years uh, when people talk about the Revolutionary War, I try to offer an alternative and say it wasn't a Revolutionary War. Revolt comes from rebellion and that's resisting lawful authority and God doesn't condone that. It was a war of ind independence because the, yes. the Parliament tried to insert themselves in the colonies which they had no right. That was between the king and the colonies. Yeah, and that's, that's very true. I, you know, I'll use the Revolutionary War but technically, that is not a correct term. I agree with David Elmer, and sometimes I remember John Quaid and uh, Randy Lee used to call it the, the colonial war for Christian liberty. So, you know, we get these these monikers that they put on, and, and we, it's hard to exactly from our brain. Like, for instance, you'll hear me use the term once in a while, not very often anymore, to ever use the term civil war, the civil war. I know that's not a correct term. It, it was never a civil war, you know, because it was two countries fighting each other. One country with internal fighting is a civil war, but it wasn't a civil war because if the South were the Confederate States of America, so it was, you know it's more it should be called the War of Northern Aggression or Lincoln's War Against Christianity, whatever term you want to put, but it should not be the Civil War. But you've been saying it for 50 years, I was saying it for 40 years. It's a hard, you know, 30 years, 20 years, whatever. It's hard to break those habits, but I, I do understand what what he's saying there. But we're talking about if you can get that, a Christian may resist the tyrant. But we don't rebel against them. Rebellion comes in when one disobeys or resists a lawful authority. If we re resist that lawful authority, like the son gave the illustration of the car keys and going out, he thinks his dad's a tyrant because he's not let him out fun that weekend. Now he's in rebellion. Let's look at that in the book of 2 Kings. If you would, open your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 11. We'll begin reading in verse 1 of 2 Kings 11. And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal seed. So, this is the mother of a king. The king dies, and he's got a whole bunch of kids. The mother says, you know what, my son, and her, yeah, he didn't do that great of a job. I'm just going to take over here. I really know what to do. So she kills, she's a murderess, she becomes a tyrant, and she murders all her grandkids. I mean, just talk about demonic spirits. Grandmother killing all her grandkids. So she destroys all the royal seed. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain. They hid him, even his him and his nurse. So he's just an infant, and you know, kings, you know, they, they, they probably have several different war with just one wife. There's a bunch of kids there, and, and you know, you don't go into the king very often as chamber. You don't know all that all the kids he might have. So she thinks she's got them all. But there was a little baby. Someone had the wisdom to hide him. Okay, there was a little baby that came from Isaiah. Isaiah. So they stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain. And they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. Now, 
And he was with her hid in the house of the Lord. Oh, wow. those rebellious Christians in the house of God hiding someone. No, not at all. Not rebellious. Wise. Prudent. And he was hid with her in the house of the Lord six years. And Athaliah did reign over the land. Six years of tyranny. Time for the people to get weary of tyranny. Time for God to do a new thing. God to do a new plan in the, in the earth. And in the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and fetched the rulers over hundreds. And by the way, Jehoiada's a priest. So he's the pastor. He's the minister. He's the, he's the pastor here. In the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and fetched the rulers over hundreds with captains and the guard and brought them to him in the house of the Lord and made a covenant with them and took an oath of them in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. Here's the rightful heir. That's going to make a covenant before God that we're going to defend the one that God wants on the throne, not the one who has usurped the throne. And he commanded them, saying, This is the thing that ye shall do. Notice that the priest, the preacher, has the plan here. And he says, This is the thing that ye shall do. A third part of you shall enter in on the Sabbath, shall even be keepers of the watch of the king's house. By the way, that keepers of the watch is a military term. When you see that, that term is used throughout the temple. The people that are going to, the men that are going to, the guards to keep the watch. It's a military term. Armed soldiers watching in the temple of God. That was a regular thing. God instituted that. Armed soldiers in the temple. It wasn't a man thing. It was a God thing. All right. They were just obeying God. And the third part, you can make up your own applications to that. And the third part shall be at the gate of Sir, verse 6, and the third part at the gate behind the guard, so that you shall keep the watch of the house, that it be not broken down. And two parts of you that go forth on the Sabbath, even they shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord about the king. And you shall compass the king round about. You're going to protect him with armed guards. Every man with a weapon in his hand. Even at the point of killing the enemy. And he that cometh within the ranges, they come too close, they're, 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 or they're on the, the wicked Athaliah's side, let him be slain. And be ye with the king as he that goeth out and is he that cometh in. You're going to be with the king. You're going to protect this little guy. He's actually, I think, only about eight, eight or nine years old. He's, you know, seven, maybe eight. All right? And you're going to protect this. He is the rightful king. The captains over the hundreds did according to all the things that Jehoiada the priest commanded. And they took every man, his men, that were coming on the Sabbath with them, that should go out into the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the priest. They've had a, they've planned. They've had a, they've, they've executed. Now they're executing the plan. And the captains over hundreds did the priests give King David's spears and shields that were in the... Where's that? Somebody read it. No. We better, this is the wrong version. We better, I don't know, maybe, I, maybe after all the King James is not where I want to go. Can't be the temple. Temple can't be where you're hiding spears and shields and weapons of warfare. Yep, that's exactly where you put weapons of warfare. So the priest gave King David's spears and shields. Under, you need to underline that. Yeah. You guys that do underlining, put that. See that. You've got to understand that with the Christians of today, the the you know the uh, milk toast Christians of today don't like a militant talk. You need to just point this out to them. Of course, they're going to have an answer that it's the Old Testament. Yes. But you just tell them the Old Testament, according to the Apostle Paul, is yes. God breathed for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness. Amen. Every commentator, every commentator I've ever read is in agreement. The church is united on that front. That the word that the Old Testament is given for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness. All right. So they get armed because we're going to have a we're going to have a military coup here in just a minute. And we're going to have tyrannicide take place. And I'll explain that in a minute. And the guard stood, every man with his weapons in his hand, round about the king, from the right corner of the temple to the left corner of the temple, all along the altar in the temple. And he brought forth the king's son and put the crown upon him and gave him the testimony, the covenant of God, that he would do that. And they made him king and anointed him, poured the oil. Ah, that's a type of the Holy Spirit coming upon him for leadership. So they anointed him and they clapped their hands. And said, God save the king. You thought England invented that. God save the king. God save the queen. No, no, no. That's been around a long time. God save the king. Or long live. God give the king life. And when Athaliah, who is the queen, ruling over, she is the current potentate. She is the current civil leader. All right, the queen. She's the queen. 
When Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people into the temple of the Lord. What is all this noise and this ruckus? Hey, who's trying to assert my authority? And when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar as the manner was, as they had all set up that thing, knew how that stuff went down. And the princes and the trumpeters by the king and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew with trumpets. And Athaliah rent her clothes and cried, Treason, treason. Oh, was it treason? No, no not at all. Not at all. She was but we have a saying today, it's dangerous to be right when the government is wrong. And they would call us treasonous. They would call us rebels. But who really is the rebel? Who really is the tyrant? Who really is the one who has committed treason? Our, our, you know, many of our U.S. senators and congressmen should be tried for treason. Correct. Yeah. Treason against the Constitution, against the law of the land. They break it with, you know, just constantly. So she's crying treason, treason. I have a little saying here, protestations are of no avail when conflicted by the fact. She can say treason, but the facts were she's a murdering tyrant who needs to be deposed. So she cried treason, treason. But it was to no avail because the facts were she's a murderess. She's a tyrant. But Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds and of the officers of the host and said to them, have her forth from out the ranges, go outside, and him that followed with her, anybody that's trying to back her up and give her guard, kill him with the sword. Kill her and, the, and, and her guard, bodyguard. For the priest had said, Let her not be slain in the house of the Lord. And they laid hands on her, and she went by the way of which the horses came into the king's house, and there she was slain. So they killed her. That's tyrannicide. And Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king. So that the king and the Lord, the king is going to rule in the Lord's eyes, according to the scripture. And the people, that they should be the Lord's people, and between the king and the people also. You need to underline verse 17. I'm not going to get to it. Just have it or put it in parentheses. That's a very important thing. That the, that the civil magistrate, the ruler, is in covenant with God to obey God and serve the people. And the people then make a covenant with the king and the civil magistrate and say, we will serve you. We will not rebel against you as long as you are serving God and have his aim and his honor in view. We will, even if we don't particularly like it, we will because we know your, your heart is towards serving the God. You're serving God. So there's two covenants that are made there. Now, so what we have just seen in 2 Kings 11, 1 to 17 is a murdering, usurping tyrant coming under armed resistance, not armed rebellion, armed resistance, okay? And Athaliah succumbs to tyrannicide. Tyrannicide, what most of you know it is, but in case someone here doesn't, tyrannicide is the act of killing a tyrant. You have genocide, where you're trying to wipe out and kill a whole group or race of people, but in this case, in this case, this is tyrannicide, the killing of a tyrant. Now, I'll be talking about armed resistance in a few moments, but first I want to deal with other biblical methods in dealing with tyrants. I have brought these in individual messages in years past, but just by way of review, we're going to look at these very quickly and then uh, look at some other material that I want to get at today. So there are four major methods in dealing with tyrants. There's other methods, but these are the four major ones, just like there are four major forms of government. When you have a tyrant, the first thing you may do, you may choose to do, these aren't in any exact order per se, you may protest the tyrant. A protestation is a public censure. How do we see that in the Bible? We see John the Baptist mouthpiece of God at that time, standing up and saying to King Herod, it is unlawful, and people are listening, people are around him hearing, King, it is unlawful for you to kill your, let's see, your, what is it, your, to kill your bro the brother, the husband of, uh, say it again, Kevin, I can't Sleep get it. Sleep with your brother's wife. Sleep with your brother's wife. Yeah, kill, yeah, okay. So, yeah, it was his brother. So, it's unlawful. You can't kill your brother so that you can sleep with his wife. The daughter is so so Salome or Salome, and the mother is, I don't know, somebody's got that. It's not coming to me. Anyway, the point is, 
He stands up and he protests and he censures publicly the king for this act of murder so that he could, so that he could uh, get to his brother's wife. Right? He says, you can't do it. That's protestation to the time. No time. You, no. Ah, uh ah. -uh. No, can't do it. Okay? There's other ways of protestation. That is, you can wipe the dust of your feet off a, off a group of in, or an individual. That's found in Luke chapter 10, verse 11, where, where, where God, Jesus sends out the, 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 you know, the south wind, and he says, go and do this and that, and he says in the 12, and another place, and he says, if they don't receive you, go outside the gates of the city and actually wipe the dust of your feet so you're free from the conscience of these people. You're not going to participate anymore. A boycott is saying, I'm not going to buy that product from that company because they're you know, doing whatever they're doing. And, and boycott is a way of protesting to say to the tyrant, no, 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 you're stepping over the bounds. Another way is Jesus in protestation against a tyrant, not cooperating in the courtroom with Pilate. That's in Matthew 27 and verse 14. Pilate asked Jesus a question, and what, is he, what does Jesus do when Pilate asks him a question? Most of the time. Either, he, he, yeah, he doesn't say anything. You ask him a question, you might ask him a question back, but he doesn't participate. He lets Pilate know that he doesn't, eventually he does talk. First, he does not participate in the, in the kangaroo court that's going on there. He does not participate in it. He's not going to have any good. So Jesus himself refuses to cooperate. The second way in dealing with the tyrant is through what we call the biblical doctrine of deception. And when you're thinking of deception, it's important to remember, what is deception? How do people use deception? Deception is a tactic of war. It's an accepted tactic of war. I sell at, uh, at our store camouflage clothing. Camouflage clothing and camouflage paint is to deceive the enemy to think that you're not there when in fact you are there. Deception is a tactic of war. Those of you that read Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu says you feign weak when you're strong, and when you're strong, you feign weak. You know, he, says, he says if you're very strong, you don't let the enemy know that. You deceive the enemy to think that you're actually quite vulnerable over here, when actually you're really, really super reinforced. All right? This is deception, and it's a part of warfare. How many have ever heard of something called the Patriot Act? That's a deception. That's a, that's a, that's a war technique of war used against the, the American people under the guise of the Patriot Act. Oh, boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? The lovers of America, lovers of the Constitution Act. And it's anything but that. That's a tactic of war. They're using it against us because the American citizens have been uh, at war. Or the, not, 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 let me say that again. The government, the federal government has been war with the American citizens since the World War I. We weren't at war with them. They chose the war on us. It's like the jihadists. They're, they, they choose to be at war with America. We didn't choose that battle. But Muslims choose that battle against us. There's a big difference there. All right. But deception is a tactic of war used throughout the Bible. Uh, the Hebrew midwives is the best example. They told the Pharaoh, you know, he says, kill those boys when they're born. And they told him, we can't do that. And they birthed, allowed the little boys to be born. And Pharaoh says, why are you doing this? And they lied and said, the mothers are not like, uh, you know, the, the mothers of the Hebrews are not like the Egyptian wives, but they're lively upon the stools, and they're just, they're right there, and, you know, they're, they're, they, they take the baby, and we can't do anything about it. Rahab the harlot, she lied, and she deceived the enemy so that those, the two Hebrew spies might be preserved, and she hit him up in the straw over the roof of her house. And then our Lord himself uses deception against a tyrant. I think we'll go there. Open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 16. You say the Lord uses deception? Yeah, the Lord uses deception. Now we're talking about not lawful authority. Make it very clear in your mind. We're not talking about deceiving lawful authority. So if, 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 the, if the mother has asked the child, did you take that cookie? The child cannot say, try and deceive the parent. It's a lawful authority. Even if he knows he's going to get his hand slapped or he's going to get his bottom blistered, right? So, did you take that cookie? I cannot tell a lie. I cut down the cherry tree. Or I can't tell a lie. I cookie, right? right? So, that's, that's you, have, you have to obey lawful authority, even if it means the consequence is a spanking. That's the appropriate thing to do. But we're talking about dealing with tyrants. They were in 1 Samuel chapter 16 today. For tyrants, not lawful authority, resisting of tyrants and tyranny. 1 Samuel 16, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long shalt thou... Now Samuel's the prophet of the land, right? 
How long shalt thou mourn for Saul? Saul is the king. He's the current civil magistrate, anointed by God, but he's been in rebellion against God, and he's become a tyrant. Seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel, fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. God says to Samuel, and will stop mourning. Saul is a tyrant, but we've got other things to do. I want you to go, and I'm going to show you who is going to be the new king, and I want you to anoint that new king in Israel. Now, note what Samuel says, verse 2. And Samuel said, how can I go and do this? If Saul hear it, he's a tyrant. He will kill me. He loves the power. He's power hungry. The power has corrupted him in his mind. And the Lord said, take a heifer. Now, this, now Pastor Campbell's not saying this. The Lord uses deception. You read the text yourself. Samuel says, I can't go to anoint David because Saul's going to hear about he's a tyrant. He doesn't want any, any, any competition. He'll kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with thee and say. So Saul sees Samuel coming down the road and something's a big to do because the people are watching the prophet. And he's got a heifer with him. And, he, and, 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 and King Saul's going to say, what are you doing with that heifer? Well, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. But what is the real motive? He's come to anoint a new king over Israel. You see, everybody's following that, right? And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. All right? So there's, there's another example of the biblical doctrine that said, We're talking about how do you deal with a tyrant? Some, the, 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 the people are tyrannizing the people of God. Another way is through what's known as the doctrine of avoidance or flight. That is, you try to stay away from the tyrant as much as possible. You may move from one location to another. You may try and stay what people call in today, flying under the radar. How many have heard the term flying under the radar? You know what that means? That means you're trying to not to be a conspicuous person. There's a time when you fly under the radar. There's a time when you stand up and you let the chips fall where they are. So maybe for a time there's people, I know I knew people in, uh, up in Oregon years ago that t took this view of flying under the radar, avoiding the tyrant at all possible. You didn't want to do anything to disrupt the tyrant and get the tyrant mad at them because they had lots of little ones, two and three year olds and four year olds and one year olds and all that kind of stuff. And they had large families and they didn't want the, 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 the tyrant to know exactly that they were God-fearing people, because they didn't want to be persecuted, and so they kind of stayed under the radar. You, there may be a time when you, you do that. These are these are different methods at different times of the Holy Spirit's got to lead us and guide us as to what, or what we're doing there. But the best example for the, uh, well, let me, I, let me just back up. Avoiding the tyrant. If you want to look at that, you can look at that in Genesis chapter 26. I'm not going to go there, but in Genesis 26, in his example, and it's an example of avoiding Avoiding the tyrant. And Isaac does this several times. He, he digs a well. He's going to drink water from it. The tyrant comes and says, that's my well. So Isaac says, all right, fine. I'll go over here. I'll dig a well. The tyrant comes and says, I want that water. Isaac says, okay, well, all right, fine. I'm not big enough. I'm, there's reasons why he does this. I'm not big enough. I'm not, I'm not strong enough militarily to take on these tyrants at this time. So, okay, you guys want the well? Some of you recall we did that very thing when we started a radio station up on the hill here. <laughs> we, I, uh, somebody was known as a kid called the Mount Diablo, and the BLM came and said, you can't have a radio station up there. We said, oh, okay, we'll take it down. People's land, but we said, okay, we'll take it down. That's avoiding. That was not the time to take a you know, stand. Avoiding. So Also, you can flee. Flee the tyrant. The, be the best example we all know of is we're coming up on that time of year, and Joseph and Mary. Okay? Joseph and Mary, the time after the birth of Jesus, he's born, and Herod's jealous as all get out, typical tyrant, doesn't want anybody on anybody challenging his authority to his to the throne. And so he says, you know, you know the story that all the kids be murdered, slaughtered, two years and under. And so what what does Mary and Joseph do with the edict that all kids two years and under are going to be killed? Go to Egypt. They fled. They fled to Ed, they fled to Egypt. And I was an adult before I realized that those that the kings those wise men, the magi that offered him gold, frankincense, and myrrh, 
That was how God was providing for Jesus to stay all those years down in Egypt. Tell them, you know, they had a financial ability. They had gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They could sell it, and they could live down in Egypt and raise Jesus until they got to be a young man and then, you know, come back. So God was at work all that time. But what we, what we see here is they fled the tyrant. Christians oftentimes need and can flee. Jesus himself teaches that. Well, open your Bible to Matthew chapter 10. I just want you to know that you're aware of this verse. This is a good one. This, what we call the biblical doctrine of flight comes from the mouth of Jesus himself. In, in Matthew chapter 10, and verse 23, he tells his disciples this. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye to another. One of the things that got my mind thinking about this, I was reading a book on, uh, it's called the Liberty and Property, the uh, history of uh, Liberty and Property. And I was looking at these men, different men in their lives, and as the author was talking about in this book, and he would say, this man came to America, he fled tyranny. This person came to America, he fled persecution. Why are they going from one place to another? Because Jesus said if they persecute you in one city, flee to another. That is a method of dealing with the tyrant. That is a method. We might protest the tyrant. We might deceive the tyrant. We might try to avoid him at all costs. We might flee from the tyrant. We might flee from the tyrant. And so that's exactly what many who came to America, they were fleeing tyranny. My grandparents fled Italy from Mussolini. I didn't know that, Kevin. Wow. Kevin's parents fled no, Mussolini. What's that? Grand grandparents. 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 I did not know that Kevin. How long ago he's here? Okay. Kevin's grandparent, grandparents fled Mussolini and the persecution that was going on in Italy. They saw this guy as a madman. How many people fled, you know, from Hitler? How many didn't see in time? Got stuck in that mess under Hitler because they did not know the days and the hour in which they were living. Then the fourth way of dealing with armed, with uh, tyranny is actually through armed resistance with the goal of tyrannicide to destroy the tyrant kill the tyrant we just saw that in 2 Kings chapter 11 with Athaliah there's many conflicts in the Bible that talk about armed conflict against, a, against an oppressor yet Saul, King Saul and Jonathan before Saul became a tyrant he was, he was authorized watch this now before Saul became a tyrant he was authorized by God, he and his sons, to fight the Philistines who were tyrannizing the children of Israel. And had taken away all their weapons so that in 1 Samuel chapter 13 it says there was only one spear and one sword and that was with Saul and Jonathan, the whole nation of Israel. Because, and it says, because the Philistines had said, just like Barbara Boxer, just like Diane Feinstein, just like all that, all that ilk up there, we can't have weapons in the hands of the common people. The Philistines said that way back then. And so he, the ones, King Saul and Jonathan, they were the ones that had weapons. Okay, according to the story. So they, had to, they fought the tyrant. They fought the tyrant. And as Saul was yielding to the Lord, God was blessing him. But when he became a tyrant himself, God says, no. By the way, you know, Job says that. In the book of Job, he says, In the hands of the Lord are the deceiver and the deceived. When, when, the, when the tyrant begins to oppress others, he himself enters into his own form of deception. He's deceiving himself that he's something when he is nothing. The Bible says, take heed to ourselves that we think we're something when we are nothing. Now, before the, and before we get this, some thoughts I want to get to today. That was just a, a review, a quick review of things that we've, we've dealt with you know, in, in, in detail prior in prior years. But before we go to armed resistance, there are four serious considerations that we must look at. Solemn implications, and I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing here heavily from Pastor John Weaver, which I, I'm, I'm indebted to. And uh, so, before you would take up the sword and enter into armed conflict, there's four serious considerations that we need to do. And so, this is, I think this is going to help you to see it. Where are we in a big glass? Where are we in America today? Where are we in California today? I think this will help to answer some of those questions. So before you go into armed resistance, here's some considerations. Number one, do we have the strength, resources, ability, and will to carry on a full-scale war on a long-term basis? 
you know, men tend to sometimes, there's a really good illustration of this in, um, it's Glennis Johns, is the actress, and I forget the actor's name, he's a Scott, the Scottish actor. Anyway, he, he uh, in, the, in the movie, I believe it's called The Sword and the Rose, I get wrong the title there. But anyway, it's Scottish going against English tyranny. And uh, and at one point, uh, they're going to, oh, we're just going to war, we're just going to kill the England. And Glennis Johns is the, the, the wife or the mother, or whatever, the girlfriend, says, yeah, you men are always ready to go off to war real fast, but who's going to be left? Who's going to be left to raise the little ones when you guys are all slaughtered on the field? So this, you know, what she's saying is, yeah, you guys, like, man, they're hot, at least at that time, the Scots, you know, they were, they were ready to go, we'll go to war, we'll defend. She says, wait a minute, think about this. Yeah, you'll go to war, you get killed, all right, but then I'm left, and I'm left with all these little ones to raise. Let's calm, let's calm the rhetoric down, let's think this through, let's make sure. It's just a little scene there, but it was a wise scene, and, and, he, and, and she was right, and he listens to her, and goes a different direction. So, so you know, that's why we have consideration before we start. I can't take this over. Okay, all right, you might do that, but can you have, do you have the strength, resources, and ability, and will to carry on a full-scale war on a long-term basis? Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 14, as Jesus teaches here on the subject of war. Luke chapter 14. Just a little illustration here. But he's familiar that kind of the concepts of war, warfare. In Luke 14, verse 31, Jesus says, Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth, let's have a little consultation, the multitude of counselors there are safety, whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Let's think this through. Okay, we got 10, they got 20. Maybe we'll take this on if God's calling us to it. If he's not calling to us, this looks like a foolhardy mission. See, some missions can be foolhardy. Verse 32, or else while the other is yet a great way off, he might decide to send an ambassage and desire conditions of peace. So he's thinking about it. First, and I'm just going off as a hothead. Yeah, we could, let's just, there's, a, there's some X amount of soldiers over here. We can just take them out right now. Yeah, you may be able to do that, but that's all you're going to be able to do accomplish. That's not what the Lord wants. So the second question you ask yourself before you enter into armed resistance is, do we have a reasonable hope of winning? Do we have a reasonable hope of winning? In other words, if we are not on God's side, there is no reasonable hope. Open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 25. Isaiah, or Jeremiah, excuse me, Jeremiah 25, and we're going to look at uh, verse 9, Jeremiah 25. Asking the question, because you'll have people, you know, as we enter into deep, sink into further aspects of tyranny, you have people asking these questions, people wanting to do things that may be foolhardy. And you have to have the mind of Christ to discern whether you're going to participate or not. You know, John, Reverend John Witherspoon, at the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Reverend John Witherspoon, he was a pastor, the only pastor, I think, that signed the Declaration. And people were hesitating to sign that instrument because they knew it meant their death warrant. Because King George could try and hang every one of us for treason, right? So he said, there is a tie in the affairs of men. We perceive it now before us to hesitate is to consent to our own slavery. People were wondering, do I really want to sign this declaration? Because they knew it meant there's a death warrant for them, unless God would intervene. But, but the pastor got up and said, there is a tie to the affairs of men. Look around you, think about what's been happening in America. There is a tie to the affairs of men. We perceive it now before us. This is the time, in other words, this is the time. To hesitate is to consent to our own slavery and the shackles of servitude or perpetuity. So there is a time, but you have to you have to know in the mind of Christ the timing of these things. So is there a reasonable hope? Now so okay, verse 9. God says, Behold, I will send and he's speaking to his people, the children of Israel, and he says, uh, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. 
Now that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a phrase that you might want to underline. God says this pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, he calls him my servant. He's using this pagan king to spank his people. So in this particular case, Nebuchadnezzar, God says, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, because I'm using him to spank you guys for your idolatry and you're turning away from me. So God can use pagan kings as his servant tools, and you have to be aware of that. And will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and a perpetual desolation. He's going to fly out there, done for, not much left. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth, joyfulness, happiness, and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of millstones in the light of the candle, and the whole land shall be a desolation and astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Folks, if God is not in it, you don't have a reasonable hope of winning. If God's face is set towards judgment, God's face is set towards condemnation, we don't have a reasonable hope of winning. But there are times when we don't know. I think of this, the illustration of Jonathan and his armor bearer. They go out and they, they two men take on a whole garrison, a whole army. Philistines and God and Jonathan, what does he say? He's you know, a man of faith, and he says, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't hinder the Lord. He can save with many or he can save with few. But the timing was a different thing. The battle was a different thing. So there was a whole different set of circumstances with Jonathan and his armor bearer, and two of them go out to war. Sounds pretty foolhardy. Foolhardy circumstances. The anointing. We, I'm talking about. I'm actually going to close it. The understanding the anointing of God today, having I mean, an awareness of the anointing when it comes and when it leaves, and so on and so forth. So John and they go for it, and God, you know, they slay, slay a bunch of them. God brings a victory there. To you guys. Now, so we're asking the question before somebody's talking about armed conflict: Is there a reasonable hope of winning? Do we have the resources to gain, and the strength and the ability to carry a full-scale war in a long-term basis? Wars take a lot longer than we think. Right? The Yankees thought they were going to come in, and Lincoln thought in 90 days he was going to destroy the South and subjugate them. And that war lasted, what, over five years? Lincoln thought 90 days. And these things can be protracted. Now, number three, are the people, listen, are the people tired not only of tyranny, but of their sin? Are they tired of tyranny? No. No, not yet. Are they going to vote Jerry Brown in again? Yes. Probably. It's, it's easy to tell you how far we really are from these things. We're not tired of their tyranny. So they voted Barack Obama again a second time. The first time was, you know, you maybe could forgive the ignorance of the people. The second time they knew how evil and wicked he was. You know, he's the strongest, you know, the hardest uh, pro abortion president we've ever had. Kill babies, kill babies, that's his thing. And they put him in a second time. We have to, these things we have to consider. Are the people not only tired of the tyranny, but of their, of their sin? Open your, uh, open your Bibles to uh, Judges chapter 10, please. Judges chapter 10. That's a good question, isn't it? Or not, see, you've got to decide. Now, obviously, some people don't like the unjust taxation and the heavy load of the oppressor's hand that we feel today, but the sin issue is we bother them a bit. So they have to be tired, not only of tyranny, but of their sin and their, their idolatry and turning away from the one true and the living God. And in Judges chapter 10 and verse 10, it says, The children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and served Balaam. You have here the sin of omission and commission. The sin of omission is they omitted to serve God. The sin of commission is they went and served Balaam. We talk about sins that when we want asking the Spirit of God to purify our hearts and, and see as David see, try me, Lord, search, search my heart. See if there's sins of omission or commission in my life. See, it could be either one. And so they said we both sin because we've forsaken God and served Balaam because there, there's a threat of war. On them right now, and they're going to get wiped out. 
And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians, and from the Amorites, and from the children of Ammon, and from the Philistines, the Zidonians also, and the Amalekites, and the Maonites, that did oppress you? And you cried unto me, and I delivered you out of their hand. You've got this whole record of my dealings and, and victory with you and my strong arm on behalf of you, and you've rejected me and you're worshiping all kinds of idols. Yet you've forsaken me with all these things and served other gods. Wherefore, God says, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Oh, you've been worshiping Baal and Ashtaroth? Go ahead. Go talk to Baal and see if he's going to preserve you against, these, against the Gileadites or whatever. Verse 15. God, see, God's bringing them to a deeper repentance. And boy, how many of you know we need a deeper repentance? And how many of you know that Pastor Campbell needs a deeper work of repentance in his life today, right now, where we speak? You need a deeper work of repentance. I need a deeper work of repentance. God, my, my dad used to pray. He said, God, we, 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 help me to fear you in a proper way, a proper sense. You are God, King of kings, blessed and only potentate. See? God's trying to bring them to a deeper repentance than just saying, ouch, I don't like the tyranny. Ouch, I don't like this law. Ouch, I don't like that law. Ouch, these people are coming to destroy me. Verse 14, go and cry unto the gods that you have chosen and let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Verse 15, and the children of Israel said unto the Lord, we have sinned. Now notice how God's bringing them around to a deeper work. Do thou unto us whatever seemeth good unto thee, Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And, and they put away, they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. They destroyed the idols, got rid of all that idolatry in their life. Anything that was keeping them away from their, from between their soul and God Almighty. And then God, it says that God's soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. And if you go on to read the chapter there, God does deliver them. He raises up Jephthah to lead them in battle. But God was saying to them, you've got to, you just can't be because you don't like the, this law or that law or that unjust thing. You've got to have a deep work where you recognize that you have affronted a holy God. And we need to have that deep work in America. We need to have that deep work that there is no king but King Jesus and he is the blessed and only potentate. All right? so, it, so number three, are the people tired? Not only of tyranny, but are they tired of their sin? And God is working repentance. Deep, deep repentance in their life. Then lastly, number four, is God directing the effort? See, anybody can go off half-cocked and say, I don't like this, I don't like what's happening. Let's go to four. Is God directing the effort? How many remember back uh, some gal, Linda, I think her name was the attorney, Linda Thompson was going to lead some, and Fred might remember Linda Thompson, they were, she was going to lead a march on Washington, D.C. Yeah. back around 92 or 93. We said, we ran from it. No, 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 no. The people aren't ready. The people aren't, don't, we don't want to have church. Queen doesn't want anything to do with that. Anything to do with that. Somebody was going to have a march on Washington here not too long ago, this last summer, I think. No, 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 no. Let's, I want to know, I want to know those who are leading that. Where are they in church? Whose ministry are they under? Are they submitting to a church leadership somewhere? Not to be the church of Quia, but who is the pastor they're submitting to, see? Or do they have the mind of God in what they're attempting to do? And so oftentimes you'll find the answer is no, the Spirit of God is not in it. It's just foolhardiness. Just foolhardiness. So is God directing the effort? Can you see God's hand clearly in the effort? And we're almost done here, folks. Go to Exodus chapter 33. And we see God's hand in what's happening and what's being laid out. Exodus chapter 33, verses 14 and 15. Moses says to God, verse 13, And now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, Show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And verse 15 is key here. And Moses said unto him, If thy presence not go with me, carry us not up hence. God, if you're not with us, I don't want to be a part of it. You're, going to, you know, you're leading us into this victory, 
It sounds like you know, all these, this promise of this stuff and good stuff for our people, but I want to make sure that you're the one that's leading. I want to make sure that your presence is going to go with us. And if God's presence is with us, he said he'll never leave us nor forsake us, whether in life or in death, God's presence will be there for you and I if we're following him. So it doesn't make any difference if we win the victory in the natural or we win the victory in the supernatural in the sense that God promotes us to heaven because his presence is with us. We're going quorum Deo before his face, literally before his face. But God is moving. Do we see the hand of God clearly in the effort? And I'll close with this illustration because this is very important that we see God's hand. As I mentioned to you at the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Reverend Witherspoon says, there's a tide in the affairs of men. We perceive it now before us to hesitate in sent to war on slavery. They saw it. They saw what was happening around them. And then in 1775, Reverend Samuel Langdon, Reverend Samuel Langdon, he's a northern minister. He was involved at Breed's Hill, battle of what we call commonly Bunker Hill. And uh, he was there. He was rallying the troops the best that he could. And then he comes to his, his church on a Sunday morning. And this is in, from his, his own journal, so I'm quoting uh, Reverend Samuel Langdon. June 20th, 1775. This has been one of the most... Uh, DJ, would you let Joyce know I'm winding down here? He's winding down she, right now. Been, <laughs> yeah. She was out feeding the baby a few minutes ago. She told me to let her know. This has been one of the most important and trying days of my life. I have taken leave of my people for the present and shall at once proceed to the American camp at Boston to offer my services as chaplain in the army. Ever since the Battle of Bunker Hill, my mind has been turned to this subject. God's servants are needed in the army to pray with it and for it. This is God's work. He sees the American war for Christian liberty, not the American Revolution. He sees the, the war for colonial war for Christian liberty as God's work. This is God's work, and his ministers should set an example that will convince the people that they believe it to be God's work, too. But the scene in the house of God today has tried me sorely. How silent, how solemn was the congregation when they sang the 61st Psalm commencing, when overwhelmed with grief, my heart within me dies. That's because the pastor said on this is my last Sunday with you, I'm going off the battle. Sobs were heard in every part of the building. At the close, I was astonished to see Deacon S, just Deacon, Deacon Blank, now clearly 60 years of age. Now remember, 60 in 1775 is pushing 80 yeah. in 2015, 2014, all right? So 60-year-old is an 80-year-old basically today. All right. Deacon Blank, now clearly 60 years of age, arise and address this congregation. Brethren, said he, our minister has acted right. This is God's cause. And as in the days of old, priests bore the ark into the midst of the battle, so must they do it now. We should be unworthy of the fathers and mothers who landed on Plymouth Rock if we do not cheerfully bear what providence shall put upon us in the great conflict now before us. We owe a duty to the founding fathers, those who pledged their lives, fortunes, and sacred honor in the holy cause of liberty. And then he says, the deacon, I had two sons at Bunker Hill. One of them, you know, was slain. The other did his duty, and the future God must do with him what seemeth him best. I offer him to liberty. I had thought that I would stay here with the church. But my minister is going, and I will shoulder my musket and go too. In this strain he continued for some time, till the whole congregation was bathed in tears. Now listen to what Reverend Langdon says here. Oh, God must be with this people in the unequal struggle. No illusions there. The unequal struggle. Or how else could they enter upon it with such solemnity and prayer, with such strong reliance on His assistance, and such a profound sense of their need of it? 
Just before separating, the whole congregation joined in singing, O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Where are we today in the battle for the holy cause of liberty? We need God. We need a move of God. I'm talking about divine intervention, tugging at your heartstrings and my heartstrings. And may it begin in us. Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you that it instructs us and that it speaks to us. Lord, we are under tyrants, the hand of tyrants. We feel the heel of tyrants. We feel the jack-booted thug, uh, the boot of a jack-whatever. We feel the heel, heel of a tyrant upon our necks. But Lord, we look to you. We look to you. Father, I pray that you would move upon our hearts. I pray for repentance would be deep, deep in my heart, Lord. May it begin at the house of God. May it begin in the pastor of Church at Kauia's heart. A deep, deep work of repentance, Lord. Move by your Spirit. Things are accomplished not by might, nor by power, but by your Spirit, Lord. Use the church of Korea, Lord, in a way that uh, hitherto it has not been used. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.